Hello and welcome to another programme in the Heroes of the Faith series. And I'm pleased to say that my special guest today is Pastor Colin Eckhart. Colin is known to many of you as an um, apostolic leader in the Kingdom Faith uh, Church, where he was the founder of it as well. Also, more recently, very well known as a writer and as a broadcaster and as well as an international speaker at conferences. Colin, lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to be here. Colin, um, I guess most people, most Christians, have prayed at some point or another for revival. They want to see, they want to experience it. How would you define revival? It's become almost a meaningless word now because people take it to mean whatever uh, they experience, you know, a little move of the Spirit in their lives and they say this is revival. Of course, what the word technically means is a bringing back to life. Uh, really, I think the only way that you can define revival from a biblical point of view is that it's bringing God's church back to living New Testament Christianity. So you begin to see really the New Testament life, love, power and fruit that you read about in the scriptures. When you look at your story, you were vicar at a certain time of a church called St. Hughes's Church in, in Luton, mm -hmm. where things began to happen. D do you think what happened at St. Hughes's Church Luton was revival? I never called it revival when I was there. Uh, we didn't call it anything. Uh, people call me a leader in the charismatic movement. We never use that phrase because we were looking at the scriptures and saying, well now, God's intention is for his church to be just as live now as it was then, to have the same life, the same love, the same power now. So we wanted God to impact us and to transform us from a very uh, usual sort of Anglican congregation into a body of people that really knew the Lord uh, and were able to impact our community and to see the kinds of transformation of life and healings taking place of which we read in the scriptures. So that was our motivation. It wasn't that we were trying to be revived or, or anything like that. I, I would probably not even have understood what revival was in those days. It was simply a question of listening to what the Spirit of God was telling us and putting that into practice. He did the rest. Now, I remember you telling me that uh, the bishop told you that the two previous vicars at that particular church, I think, has had nervous breakdowns and left. And he said to you, well, if you go there and sort of spend a little time there, I'll move you on to somewhere that'll be a bit better. So what happened that caused you to have an impact in that community where maybe other ministers had gone in and no effect at all? Well, the short answer to that is God happened uh, because although it was, you know, they were a very nice group of people and had done a magnificent job in, in opening a new church building without there being a penny of debt. So they were very good at raising money and uh, <laughs> providing this building. But none of them really were born again or filled with the Spirit or had personal relationship with God. So it was like beginning uh, an entirely new and different walk with God than anything that they'd known before. And the way we got launched into that was simply by looking at the scriptures and saying, well now look, in the Acts of the Apostles, this is what the church was like. Now we look at what we're like and you would say, they are so poles apart that are we really part of the same faith? And it was posing that question that then got us into the scriptures to see what God says he wants in terms of the life that he wants to communicate to us and see expressed in our lives. So it was a question of seeing one group after another come through to really being born again, filled with the Spirit, but uh, they, there was such a level of repentance and wholehearted yieldedness to God that right from the very beginning they became disciples. And there was just a tremendous love for God, love for one another, love for people, 
that everybody became a witness. You didn't have to tell people to witness, you didn't have to tell them that they should be doing this, that and the other to try to win the loss. They were just doing it. And uh, it was the same with the healings. Most amazing miracles were happening just because people had met with God and counted Him, their lives were full of the Spirit. Uh, there was this intrinsic love and faith uh, without necessarily you know, having to preach this or try to make anything happen. Really, uh, our, my experience of revival then and subsequently was God takes things out of your hands and into His hands. I mean, I'm listening to you here and I'm thinking, but anyone who's been in a, in a half-decent church has, has heard all this, you know, the call for making discipleship, the call for uh, being baptised in the Holy Spirit, the, the, the call for living out our Christian faith. So how did it become different in Luton? Well, <clears throat> you see, I wasn't calling for those things to happen. It was just a question of leading people to the Lord in what I, I call thorough repentance and faith. Uh, because Jesus said right at the beginning of his ministry, the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. So uh, I said to people right now, God wants to give you a kingdom. What we have to do is to repent. Now repentance is not just the forgiveness of sins, but a wholehearted yieldedness uh, of ourselves to God, to the sovereignty of God, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So that was what was happening wholeheartedly. It wasn't a token thing, it wasn't a formal thing, it wasn't a superficial thing. People were literally giving their all to God. Uh, and I think it was the depth of repentance plus the faith in the Word, because before we led anyone to the Lord, we ensured they knew the Gospel, that they knew what it was to be crucified with Christ, and the way they were led to the Lord, they actually sort of experienced that death with Christ. Uh, they understood the life of the Spirit and how we have to walk in the Spirit rather than the flesh. They also understood what it meant to really be committed to be uh, a member of the body of Christ, that that was part of the deal, really, that if we were going to surrender our lives to God and to the will of God, then he was going to expect us not just to be uh, the body of Christ in name, but in reality, really the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because as a result of all that, things began to happen, and then it became known what was happening, people began to descend upon us from everywhere. So at that time, it was a very unusual thing. Praise God, subsequently, you know, other churches came alive in the Spirit, but it was really breaking fresh ground at that time. I mean, it certainly was fresh uh, ground that you were breaking, and I think it became national news at the time, and, and I can certainly remember reading about it. But that word commitment you've just used that people had to make, both to, to the Lord and, and to their involvement in what was taking place in, in Luton, was very real. I mean, one of the things that you had were, were quite a number of prayer meetings going on during the, the, the week. You also had a number of um, home groups, was it, or Bible study groups that yes. were going on. Just uh, tell well, us a little the, bit. The interesting thing is that the New Testament doesn't use the word commitment. It uses the word obedience. Mm -hmm. And this was very much at the heart of what was happening, that uh, a committed person is one who obeys. So we were seeking to obey the Word of God. And of course, one of the commands that God gives us is to heal the sick. Well, from, from the beginning of this move of the Spirit, when people were first meeting with God and having their lives transformed, the healings began. And uh, by, I suppose, probably two years into the move of the Spirit, we had 18 healing groups meeting every week. Now, they were very, very focused groups. Uh, each group would come together for just half an hour. Uh, each group was only allowed to have eight people for whom they were praying. And the only words they used were the words of Scripture. They just prayed scripture over those sick people. And they could only have on their list uh, people with whom they had some kind of contact so that we knew what was happening as a result of the prayer. Now, you don't have that number of 
prayer groups unless things are happening and people are being healed. Um, so uh, the groups only lasted for half an hour. There was no chit-chat beforehand or after because in revival you were so busy, so many things are happening. Everybody then went on to their other activities. So we would pray from seven to half past. That would give people half an hour then to get to their eight o'clock activity. And in revival, you know, everybody's busy all the time. You don't say, well, I don't have time for this, I don't have time for that, because Jesus is just all-absorbing in your life. And I remember meeting somebody who was part of the, what was happening at St. Hughes's, and they, they described how the prayer meetings, I think, had been going for about six weeks, and you'd been praying uh, for, for different people. And they said then we began to realize that it wasn't so much us praying for other people as actually there were things in our own life that needed dealing with. And so that was a sign of what was happening, wasn't it? Well, we always began uh, by praying the word over our own lives first and then communicating that word that we were praying over our own lives to others because obviously it could be quite hypocritical to pray for others uh, if you had those same needs in your own life. So uh, it was very interesting we, that we were in, visited by a group of pastors that had come all the way from New Zealand to see what was happening. It was a long way to come, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, they asked me a very interesting question. They said, do the people in your church get sick? And I'd never even thought of it. I said, well, the honest answer is very rarely. And it was because, you see, uh, Jesus says the measure you give is the measure you get back. So by constantly praying for healing in other people, they were themselves living in the healing grace of God. So even when sickness attacked, people very readily got healed. So I was going to ask you, what, what were the signs that followed the, the proclamation of the world, uh, word and what was happening there? Well, the local press called us the Miracle Church. Uh, they would always say such and such is happening at the Miracle Church. Now, if you're going to have a reputation with the world, that's not a bad reputation to have. Mm -hmm. We would have non-Christian doctors phoning me and saying, I've got such and such a patient I can't do anything for. Perhaps you'll be able to help them. We had the, the consultant psychiatrist from the local um, psychiatric hospital. She would sometimes phone me and say, you know, I've got such and such a patient. Um, our drug therapy and counselling can't help, but perhaps the love that is in your church can help this person. Now, these were non-believers, but they saw the love and they, they saw the impact that we were having because every Sunday evening you would have a procession of people coming down from the hospital to come to the meeting. And, of course, they were meeting with God, getting healed. And so that became a sort of ongoing witness. And what about people coming to the Lord? I mean, we always assume in a revival that there's going to be souls which are going to be added to the kingdom. Did that take place? All the time. We, we had constant, what we called how to know Jesus and to be filled with his spirit groups. In short, know Jesus, K-N-O-W, <laughs> know Jesus groups. And we would have 25 to 30 people in those. We would have two running every month. They were four weeks, so one would start and then on the third week another one would start um, and uh, everybody had to everybody in the church had been through this all the visitors that wanted to really meet with god we encouraged them to come through these groups and we had a 98 percent success rate uh, of co people coming right the way through to this thorough repentance uh, yielding their lives to to god getting born again and being filled with the Spirit. So I would say probably on average 25 to 30 people a week were coming to the Lord. Now, Colin, we're, we're talking about something that took place quite a number of years ago now. So did, was that just a one-off thing that happened in your ministry? Or have you experienced revival in a, an ongoing manner? How would you describe well, what's been happening? Why that is so significant for me is that formed, really, the basis of the rest of my ministry. I mean, although those things happened over 40 years ago, everything that followed really was birthed out of what God did at that time. Mm -hmm. And yes, we, we had remarkable revival. Um, in some ways, even more re remarkable than happened in Luton. Um, we, 
formed, a, we became a community. We had a community actually within the congregation in Luton. When I left and started to travel, uh, the ministry became so demanding uh, that we had to have more people come and join us. So we formed a community, Kingdom Faith was originally, like a, a ministering community to people. And we had teams going out all over the place and, and so on. But where there within the community, we had to keep meeting with God. And we had this amazing um, uh, revival, really, in the holiness of God, where God just came. I mean, literally, it was, I, I know no other way of describing it than one night God just walked into the room in His holiness. We'd been seeking Him with great intensity for about five weeks before that. And uh, we were due to do a whole lot of evangelistic crusades, major things uh, in various places around the country. Like, for example, um, one of those missions was in Manchester where 70 churches were involved. So these were, these were major things. And God was saying that he wanted us to take revival into each of these things. Therefore, we needed to be in a place of revival ourselves. So. Uh, there was a sort of a time pressure that by the time these things started, we needed to have met with God in such a way. Well, what really happened then and subsequently, because of course it went on for years afterwards, is that I would preach and sometimes, even before I got to the end of my sermon, hundreds of people would run forward. They'd just fall on their knees and their faces before God. They'd start crying out to Him. People get born again, filled with the Spirit, healed, delivered with nobody ministering to them, nobody praying for them. I would be flat on my face, literally, on the platform, just meeting with God in His holiness, and I'd just look up every now and again to see what was happening. And this happened night after night, week after week, month after month, where, wherever we went. In that time, I don't know how many thousands of people came to know the Lord, were filled with the Spirit, healed. It, it, it was just amazing. But the, the interesting thing for me when I compare, compare it to what others have called revival is that it was totally spontaneous. I mean, it was God. Mm. Uh, it was almost as if we didn't have to do anything. I mean, we preached the word, obviously, but it was like standing back and watching what God would do. Amazing. We're very good at calling things revival. Um, mm. If you open up a Christian magazine, you'll say re see revival meetings. Yeah. Even uh, on TV, we see the adverts for, for revivals taking place. But yeah. apart from your, your experience in your own ministry, have you been to any places around the world and, and experienced revival taking place? The only place that I've seen the same life and dynamic that we were experiencing in those days uh, was in South America in the big uh, revival churches there. And it was my privilege to preach in some of those churches. You know, while a congregation may be as many as 150,000, 70,000, that kind of thing. But it was the same life and the same dynamic. It was on another scale because God was uh, doing things in, in, in a different way, but bringing about the same life and, and uh, the same fruit. So that was a great privilege. But it, it was also wonderful to to actually encounter the, the same life and the same love. It was the love especially. Mm -hmm. The thing that you notice more than anything else is not the miracles, but the love. The miracles are just the signs that follow. But what is the new commandment that Jesus gives? You are to love one another as I have loved you. And, you know, lots of churches, people love one another to a certain extent, but the as I love you, uh, loving one another as Jesus loves us, there, there's something just of a unique quality there that only the Holy Spirit can produce among his people. I'm sure there are some people who are listening, Colin, who would say, I long to be in a situation where I can experience the love of God. I long to be in a situation where his spirit is being outpoured and, and all we want to do is just spend time worshipping the Lord Jesus and being obedient to him. Are there certain things that we can be doing in, in order to, to move to that position where the spirit of God is, is free to, to move in our midst? Well, we, we can't force God, obviously. He, he moves according to his own plans and his own purposes in his own time. But um, 
it was the great revivalist Charles Finney who said that you can have revival anywhere you choose at any time so long as you're prepared to pay the cost. Mm -hmm. And I would say that a lot of, there's a lot of talk about revival. There's a lot of people praying for revival. But I think prayer for revival is almost a waste of time. That the only way to pray for revival is to pray to be revived. You know, when people pray for revival, they're almost praying for other people instead of saying, Lord, I need to be revived. You know the old revival prayer, Lord, send a revival and begin with me. Well, there's, there's a lot of sense in that. And, of course, Jesus teaches us that the measure you give is the measure you get back. So I think it, it's coming to the place, what we can do, ourselves is really to come to the place where we are so yielded to God ourselves that we can experience much more of Him than we have in the past. That's why um, I'm, I say in, in Luton it came out of that deep repentance, yielding of ourselves to God. The movement that I spoke about when we were a community of the Hyde, it came at the end of, of five weeks of really intensive of seeking God. Uh, really it was five weeks of repentance, which might sound ghastly, but actually they were five wonderful, wonderful weeks. And you would say that when we started, we were in a good place with God. We were a ministering community in the power of the Spirit. We were being invited all over the world. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't that we were dead or lifeless or anything like that. But God wanted to take us to another level, so we had to give ourselves to Him at another level. Can basically, I pick you up on, on that, I mean, you, you just so God is sovereign, but mm -hmm. but you said there's a paying the cost, mm -hmm. and and you've just there talked about five weeks of, of repentance. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what do you really mean when you say paying the cost? Of yielding yourself wholeheartedly to God. So, you so see, does that mean, you know, right, no television, no reading magazines, no books, just spending time studying? Well, what do you mean no, no, when no, you really no. say it, that? It's a matter of the heart. It really is the heart. How fully are we heart surrendered to the will and purpose of God? Of course, it involves cutting out of our lives whatever is, is um, counterproductive to the will and purpose of God in our lives. But it's not saying, you know, give up television and you'll get revived. Actually, when we got revived, we didn't have much time for television. <laughs> Not because we thought television was, was evil, but because there just wasn't time for it. We were so involved in what God was doing. But um, uh, no, it, it's, it, it's understanding that uh, Jesus really is our life. And uh, it, it's not just a question of only people that are involved in full-time ministry. Of course, this has to impact others. Like that movement that I'm, I'm talking about, uh, out of that we had two leaders' conferences every month for three years, apart from August, the holiday month. But for three years there were two conferences. Um, uh, so many leaders wanted to come and be impacted by, by what God was doing. So they experienced a revolution in their ministries, many of them, and went back to their churches and then, of course, there was the ongoing fruit of that. We're talking about something, as I've said, which quite a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your personal walk with the Lord fresh every day, month after month, year after year? Well, you know, right at the beginning, <coughs> in um, the Luton days, people said to me, "What?" What do you do in your personal life? And I know that a lot of people were inviting me to their, leaders were inviting me to their churches because they wanted me to take a revival or start a revival. Uh, and I said to them, well, I don't know, but all I do know is this, that by lunchtime I've spent three hours in prayer every day. And they would look at me as if I'd zoomed in from Mars. Uh, it wasn't just prayer of my own, but prayer of my own, prayer with other groups, time waiting upon God and with His Word. And, I mean, that's it. You hear of these surv surveys where so many ministers spend five, ten minutes a day in prayer. Well, you'll never get revival that way. Mm -hmm. Revival is always birthed out of prayer. 
It's birthed out of seeking God, meeting with God. So how do I keep that ongoing move of the Spirit in my life? Simply by prayer. Uh, I love to spend time with the Lord, just waiting upon Him, listening to Him. 90% of my prayer is listening to God. Only 10% is what I say to Him. Colin, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for being with us as well. Until the next time, God bless you all. Bye-bye.